Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. I admired authors. I wanted to, you know, be one one day. So that was a dream of mine since I was very young. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello and welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. This is the final episode of Season 2. I'll be back in January of 2019 for Season 3, along with a whole new lineup of amazing guests. I want to thank you all for listening, sharing, and subscribing. The show is growing at an amazing rate. On this episode, I'll be speaking with author Debbie D. Louise about her Cobble Cove mystery series. We discuss how she went from librarian to author how her cats play a role in her fiction, and what she has planned for the future. I will also confess some of my library sins to her, so stay tuned for that. So, without any further ado, let's begin. Love on the Rocks, A Cobble Cove Mystery, Book 4, by Debbie D. Louise. It's February in the small town of Cobble Cove. Love is in the air, but so is murder. When Alicia helps plan a Valentine's Day party at the Cobble Cove Library that also includes a surprise for her newlywed friend Gilly, things go wrong when a mysterious box of chocolates addressed to the director turns out laced with poison. Clues lead to a dead suspect. Although Alicia promised John she'll no longer meddle in crime investigations, she and Gilly set out to find the person threatening Sheila, who murdered the courier of the deadly candy. The three people they suspect include the professor from California, who's been romancing Sheila while she assists him with research for his book, the obnoxious patron, Rhonda Cleesman, who threw coffee at the director after refusing to pay for a damaged book, and a visiting widow staying at Gilly's Inn, who's unnaturally curious about Sheila and earns the nickname Madame Defarge for her interest in knitting. While Alicia and Gilly are trying to solve this new Cobble Cove mystery, Sneaky is introduced to Gilly's new kitten, Kitty Kai, a calico she brought home from her honeymoon in Hawaii. It's not like, at first sight, but the two cats eventually become friends. They also both play a part in foiling the killer's murder attempts. But will Alicia and Sheila survive unscathed? Get your copy of Love on the Rocks, a Cobble Cove mystery, book four, by Debbie D. Louise at Amazon.com. All right, and I am here with the author, Debbie D. Louise. And um, Debbie, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Emmett. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. It's it's a real pleasure to have you here on the show. This is actually the last show that we're going to have for Season 2. So I just want to thank you for being part of this. Oh, thanks so much for including me. So now you're a reference librarian at a public library on Long Island. You have a bachelor in arts for English and an MLS in library science. Um, you're surrounded by fiction. At what point did you decide to take the leap and start writing yourself? Well, actually, I wanted to be a writer before I even thought about becoming a librarian. Uh, when I was a child, my parents and teachers encouraged my talent. They, you know, encouraged me to write. I always loved to read and uh, and then I started writing myself. I admired authors. I wanted to, you know, be one one day. So that was a dream of mine since I was very young. And I, I think what really made me consider becoming a writer was that I took a vocational test in college. And at that point, I wasn't sure what my career path would be. But my top two uh, career choices that you know that I scored well on were li becoming a librarian and becoming an author, and it's very strange because at that point, my, the school I was going to, Long Island University, I think I was a sophomore when I took the test. They had opened up an MLS program in library science. Uh, it was an accelerated program, so I was still in an undergraduate, but I could become a librarian by taking like an accelerated course. It would be uh, you know, I, I would add it to my, my undergraduate and get my MLS with my, my bachelor's in arts. 
at the same time. So I enrolled in that. But at the same time, I kept the dream of wanting to write. And obviously, the test was right. <laughs> oh, yeah. So now you're classified as a cozy mystery author. However, your first book was a paranormal romance named Cloudy Rainbow. Tell us a little bit about that book. Cloudy Rainbow was my first published book, uh, but not the first book I ever wrote. I've been writing a very long time. You know, I, I actually was writing a lot when I was in college. I have full-length manuscripts and notebooks that I've, <laughs> you know, for years and years I've collected. Um, but Cloudy Rainbow, the, I, I self-published Cloudy Rainbow. At that time, self-publishing was becoming popular, but you were doing it not on your own, but through self-publishing companies. So I did pay to publish that book. And I did it because um, it was in memory of my cat who had passed away. I had a 15-year-old cat who was diabetic, and I had given him insulin shots since he was like seven or eight years old. He became diabetic. But when he passed away in his memory, I made him a character in the book. But I also, not only that, but I also, in the book, there were there are five characters. And each of the chapters is told through, is told, well, the, there is a main character. Her name is Dulcie. And each of the characters in the books plays a role in her life. So the book moves back and forth in time. And the question the book tries to answer, the universal question, what happens after death? So there is a theme of reincarnation in the book. It mixes uh, paranormal with technology, and it features a virtual world which is part of the part of the book and a clairvoyant. And the idea is, like I said, as I said, it, it will appeal to people who are the universal question. If people want answered what happens after death um, in the, in the, in the book, there's also a chapter where um, in, in Dulcie's college years, just like, you know, I, I, it kind of reflects what happened to me when I used to work on the Pioneer, which was the school student newspaper. I was, a, I was writing even back then. I was features editor on the paper. And she's a reporter on the student newspaper. But there is a romance in it. And again, um, there's um, the, the cat who was based on my cat. And, you know, so at that time, I wanted to publish it. So I did find a self-publisher. But Years later, you know, after I've written my series and so on, I did reprint it with my current publisher, Solstice Publishing, and it's been, you know, edited and updated. It's basically the same story, but it did come out um, this this past year as a reprint. So now your second book started the Copple Cove mystery series with a stone's throw. Mm -hmm. Now, what helped inspire this book? What happened was I, I started writing the book after a patron at my library, uh, you know, I deal with... Uh, you know, the patrons who, um, you know, they know I'm an author and I've written books and we have the books in my library. Um, the patron had re had read Cloudy Rainbow, my first book, and she encouraged me to write another book. And at the time, you know, after I self-published Cloudy Rainbow, I didn't have a lot of experience marketing or promoting. And I basically was doing it on my own. I wasn't involved with other authors. So... It didn't do so well, and I just basically, you know, gave up writing at that time. I was very busy. I was working full time at the library, and I also had a young daughter, so I didn't. I wasn't writing at the time. And she said, "Well, why aren't you? Why don't you write something new? I really love. I loved your writing. I would like you to write. You know, I'd like to read something else by you." And for a while, um, I considered what she said, but it took me a long time. It took me a couple of years before I started writing again. And that's when I came up with the idea for Stone's Throw. But I really can't say how it came about. It was just an idea that I had one day I was inspired. And I thought I might, you know, I felt like I wanted to write again. And, you know, I just started writing. But one of the things that had happened is my mother-in-law had passed away. And I, I did, like I memorialized my cat, I featured her, um, her name in the book. But the character, it was a minor character, not a main character, but I did put her her name in the book. But I was thinking of creating the main character, like myself, to be a librarian. And I didn't see the book at that time as a cozy mystery. I thought of it as a romantic suspense novel, because I do like to read romantic suspense. Um, and also, 
Um, the book has a lot of romance. The first book has a lot of romance in it. Um, nothing explicit. It is basically a cozy book. But I didn't see it that way. I thought it would be a standalone book. I thought just it had a beginning, it had an ending, and that was it. But then um, reviewers who were reviewing the book were con- called it a cozy mystery, and they said it because it took place in a small town, it had quirky characters, and it had a library cat, which <laughs> was, you know, the main character, Sneaky, the cat in the book. Um, so then... That then I thought about it and I decided to go with it, and I then I had an idea for a second book and I figured you know we'll go with the cozy mystery series and I I enjoy writing I, I read cozy mysteries also so I enjoyed writing that and the characters kind of took on a life of their own so I was able to you know go from book to book and develop the characters I've added characters you know I. I uh, take away some characters who, you know, there's different things that happen in the book, and they're murders, of course, but they are cozy. It's nothing explicit. There's not, not, a, not a lot of violence, not a lot of sex, but there is, you know, romance in the book, and there's, you know, it, it's basically a co- cozy mystery series. So that's what I've been doing. Wow, that's incredible. Now, you're a member of the International Thriller Writers, the Sisters in Crime, the Cat Writers Association, and the Long Island mm-hmm. Authors Group. Now, how have mm-hmm. these groups helped your writing? Well, I, I've i had several promotional opportunities through uh, ITW, the International Thriller Writers. My new releases have been featured in their newsletters, and I recently wrote a guest post for the uh, the Thrill Begins publication. I belong to the Sisters in Crime Online Guppies subgroup, where I've been able to network with other authors. I receive and give criticism on manuscripts and submit material for publications because I hear of new opportunities through these groups. I've been a longtime member of the Cat Writers Association. That actually was my very first group, that writing group that I joined. And that's how I, I got started in publishing because in order to join that group as a professional member, I had to have two published articles. So the group encouraged me to query articles to pet magazines and I was able to join and I, you know, published my first two articles. And I later wrote after that through that group, I found out about um, an anthology opportunity and I wrote my first mystery with cat crimes through time. Uh, It was called Stitches in Time and that appeared with more famous authors such as Carol Nelson Douglas and other very more famous but I was a beginner at the time, but more famous cat writers who are members of this group. So it has, you know, it has a varied uh, membership. And the Long Island Authors Group is a local group uh, that provides me with a chance to meet and interact with readers in my area, also meet other authors who are local. And on December 18th, I'll be at the ISOP Arts Council Holiday Book and Arts Fair with other uh, Long Island Author Group members. So that's coming up soon. But it gives me an opportunity to, to meet, you know, local authors and readers. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, really, and, and you're a cat person, so am I. And you've actually written for those cat magazines. Now, what types of topics? Because I know that, like, for example, um, I, I've read Birds and Blooms, okay? Every one of these magazines are very much centered on a certain niche, and they kind of go off in their own directions. What type of articles have you written? Well, I wrote, um, when I first started writing the articles, I wrote a lot of health articles. You know, I had a diabetic cat, Mm -hmm. so I was able to write an article about how to uh, give, you know, give insulin injections and, and, you know, what to watch for in a diabetic cat. What, you know, the, the, you know, how can you tell if your cat might be diabetic or, you know, what to do, you know, you know, support for people who, have to deal with diabetic pets. That was, you know, a big topic. Things that happened my own pet, pets. I had, uh, you know, d- different health issues that I wrote about. Uh, then I also also wrote about uh, pet grooming, and I wrote. I won a, an award, a special award from Purina. It was in the actual in the Cat Writers. They have an annual contest, and I submitted the article. It was from the online edition of Catster magazine, catster.com. The article was Brush Your Cat for Bonding, Beauty, and Better Health. 
And when I wrote the article, I wrote it because I had one cat who loved to be brushed. And we became very close through the brushing. Um, but then my other cat actually didn't like to be brushed. And it showed, like, the differences in in cats and how you can bond with them through brushing and also help them to have better health. And I won an award for that. And they gave me a beautiful engraved uh, glass plaque as well as a monetary award. So I was very happy about that and very, you know, happy that um, I was able to um, participate in the contest and win the award. It was well, oh, an that's, honor. That's incredible. Now, when it comes to article writing, would you suggest that authors kind of, you know, touch the waters on this and get involved? It depends. I, I think it's a, a great a great thing for authors who, um, you know, even an author who writes fiction, I mean, if you write nonfiction, then definitely – there, there are a lot of articles that you could write um, related to your topic and to help you sell your books and so on. But if you're a fiction writer, there are different areas that you could still write about if articles. So I think it's a great, I think it's a great thing. Um, you know, it's something that could help market your other work. It's even, a, it's a good way to start and it's a good way to, um, you know, reach other readers. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Now, you have a unique way of blending mystery novels and your love for cats, something I haven't seen before. Now, it's a very original idea. What sparked the interest in doing something like that? Uh, what roles do your cats play in the novels? The reason I like to feature cats in my book, and I don't only feature cats. I've featured other pets. I feature in my Cobble Cove mystery series, I have two dogs, uh, but I also have, oh, and there was a bird in my standalone reason to die. I had a bird. But I always have at least one cat in the book. And in the Cobble Cove Mysteries, the cat is really the main character. I mean, one of, you know, the main pet character. Uh, I think people enjoy reading about pets. I know I do. They add interest to a book. Um, often um, they do humorous things like they do in real life. Cats are characters. And dogs are different. I mean, they have their own, you know, as personality traits. But cats, very smart. Um, they do funny things. And I think people like to read about that. Um, they also, um, ha uh, readers can have a feeling of empathy. It helps them when they, you know, when they read about animals. Uh, but the cats in my books, they don't talk. They don't act like humans. They act like cats. But they often lead the main character to a clue or they help uh, her solve the mystery and, you know, and, but they do it in their own cat-like way. They don't do it like a human would do it. Mm -hmm. They might like, like in my first book, Sneaky comes across some boxes of letters and he's scratching. So he's like leading her to the box and she thinks he's using it as scratching post, but she looks and she finds these letters. So I'm just saying they might lead them to a clue, but they're not doing it like a human would do it. You know, that's kind of interesting, too, because you're you're taking traits that a cat would have and you're incorporating them in a story like characters in a book and you've basically turned them into a character. It's kind of a unique thing because you don't see it like I, I'm trying to think of any kind of story. And the only thing that's popping into my mind right now is the incredible journey. And the, the animals in that story actually had a voice. You know, they actually carried the story along. But you do mm -hmm. this in kind of a nonverbal way, which I mean, that has to be a challenge. You know, it has to be a challenge to look at your cat when it's doing something uh, different and say, you know what, I could describe that in words. Well, yes, it's, um, you, you know, I've had cats all my life. So I basically, you know, I grew up with cats. That's why I've always been a cat lover. Um, so I'm very familiar with what they do. And, and, you know, there are cats share a lot of similar traits. I mean, they all have their own individual unique personalities. They are like people in that, in that respect that they're, they're, they're all different. But um, they do similar, there are similar things that they do. And, um, you know, you know, just having had them for so long, I'm very acquainted with their ways. And I can kind of work that into the story. 
Wow, that's cool. Now, I have a cat. Uh, it's it's polydactyl, mm-hmm. okay? And for anybody who's listening and doesn't know this, it means that the cat has extra paws, and, and it's actually seen in the lynx line of cats quite often. Um, the funny thing is, is it looks like she has these little thumbs. And my question to you is, and this is a very serious question, <laughs> do you believe mm-hmm. that cats may soon take over the world now that they have opposable thumbs? <laughs> Well, I don't know about that, but I know that they've they've basically taken over the internet. Oh yeah, they have. They have. I, I watch cat uh, videos too with my cat, yeah. and it's really weird because she, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. is pawing at things. But then the other question yeah. I have is: Should well, I get mm-hmm. my cat a cell phone because it now has these paws that it can, <laughs> you know, text me <laughs> like, "Hey, hey, oh, we're all geez. out of milk," and "Hey, you need to pick up some cat mm-hmm. treats," you know, yeah. something, well. something like that. <laughs> you know, cat, cats are cats are quite popular. They really are. They're they're there there are still people who don't like them. Believe it or not. Um, but you know, once people get a cat, they have a way of cats have a way of winning you over. And I know I know for a fact. I know people who they were non cat lovers. They they didn't actually dislike cats. And somehow a cat entered their life because cats come to you. I I I strongly believe. That you don't find a cat, a cat finds you. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I'm not even going to go there because I go back to my paranormal. I go back to, but but basically, um, these people who have never liked cat, they end up somehow a cat enters their life, and it changes them completely. Mm-hmm. They are they love these cats. So there's something about a cat that is very uh, somehow attracts people. And um, I know there are people that, you know, never will like a cat, but I, I will say that people who've never had a cat and get one usually changes them. And by the way, talking about your polydactyl cat, <laughs> my cat, ca- my cat character, okay, Sneaky in my Cobble Cove mystery novels, I don't know if you know this or not, but he has his own blog. Oh. And he, he interviews other pet characters and also authors' cats. So if your cat is ever interested in being interviewed, I'd be happy to do it. I, I have a lot of authors <laughs> who have been on my blog, and I've had, I've had other cat characters who have been interviewed. In fact, I've had um, very, very, if you look at my blog, you'll see I've had all types of cats being interviewed. And um, authors' cats, like I said, and also cats from other mystery, cozy mysteries have been on it. Yeah, and and you know she's always ready for um, public mm-hmm. appearances. Uh, oh, yeah. and she's always got a pen handy, you know, right there in the paw to sign for autographs. <laughs> you know, she's kind of like one of the, you know, oh, yeah, 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 autographs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know mm-hmm. she's kind of a uh, that's drama in my queen. written in stone book. Yeah, <laughs> I have sneaky doing a autograph in that book. Uh huh. <laughs> but you know it's it's great because it really changed my life when I became um, a cat's pet, and um, I get to treat it <laughs> real nice and take care of it and. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's really nice having having a life as a cat pet. Uh, I think all humans are cat pets, and uh, <laughs> they just they, the cat picks the pet. All right. So <laughs> anyhow, so now your most recent book, okay, Love on the mm-hmm. Rocks. It's the fourth book in the Cobble Cove series. Now tell us a little bit about that and and what's going on with that story. Well, Love on the Rocks um, is the, the follows the written in stone uh, the, the fourth book in the in the series. And it actually takes place near near Valentine's Day. And uh, I don't want to go into detail because I know people will want to read the book. But, uh, you know, of course, Sneaky's in the book. There is a murder that takes place in the book. Um, there's also an attempted murder. And um, it has to do with Valentine's Day chocolates. That's all I'll give away. But there are some there's some romances in the book also. Um, you know, I don't know, people who, you know, you you can read it as a standalone. People have read my other books, um, the previous titles. Um, you know, it picks up after, you know, the third book, but the written in stone, but it's a totally different book. And like I said, it could be read as a standalone. You know, I, I think that, um, it is, it's not really holiday themed, but it does take place during Valentine's Day. It could be read at any time of the year. Um, but I don't want to give too much away because people who haven't read the previous books or have, have read the pre might, you know, I might give away a plot point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that well, happens. well, we'll keep it all on the down low. Don't worry. Now, now what else do you have going on on the horizon? 
Well, I've been, you know, I've been spending time promoting, you know, Love on the Rocks, and I've been writing some short stories in between that I'm hoping to get into various publications. But um, I do have two finished uh, completed manuscripts that I've been querying to agents. Uh, one of them is for the first book of a new cozy mystery series, also, you know, with the cat. Um, and I have a psychological thriller mm. that is a standalone book that I'm uh, also hoping to publish with uh, a, a larger publisher. But I'm very, you know, I'm very happy with my current publisher as well. I'm going to continue the Cobble Cove mystery series. I'm, I have some uh, subplots uh, in this last book that can go into the next book. So I'll be writing that at some point. Uh, but I do like to also write standalone books. Oh, well, that's good. I mean, sure. we'll keep our eyes out for that. Um, when, when you do have the next book coming out, just let me know, send me a quick email because I'd really like to read that standalone thriller. Um, now what advice would you give a new author? Cause you've written quite a bit. You've, you've done articles for magazines, you've won awards, you're mm -hmm. in groups. Um, what advice would you give a new author who's just starting out, hasn't done any of those things that you've mentioned before? Well, I would tell them that they shouldn't expect to make a lot of money right away or make any money right away. Uh, you know, they have to be prepared to spend a lot of time promoting their books as well as writing them. They should network with other authors. The writing community is really great, and everyone is very helpful. Uh, I've had a lot of support from writers who, you know, there's a spectrum there. There are self-published authors. There are traditionally published authors. There are authors who, um, you know, who are famous, and there are authors who are just starting also. But the whole community is very helpful. Um, you know, we network a lot online. Or like I said, if you join groups, if you join a local authors group, that could be very helpful too. I've met a lot of uh, other authors. Uh, I've become friends with several local authors, and we've, you know, promoted one another online and, in, you know, and at these events. And But I would also say one thing I found helpful is after, as you write your books, after you complete your first draft, what I do when I write, and most I think most authors should do this, you know, don't edit yourself as you write because the create the idea is the creativity. Just write, keep writing. Um, you know, I write a little each day. I I tend to be a morning person, but it depends on what you know what you're comfortable with. But after you write your first draft, let it sit for a bit. Or at that time, it's a good time to get a beta reader, have somebody else look it over, uh, just for, um, you know, for any suggestions they might have, or before you, you know, self-edit it or send it to an editor, how, you know, you might want someone to look it over. But let it sit, don't look at it after you've finished it, before, you know, give it a little rest, because you want to look at it with a different eye. You know, when you're first writing it, you're doing it creatively. But when you're editing it, that's a whole different uh, way of looking at it. And and the, the final thing I really want to say to people, the most important thing, is to believe in yourself and not rely on reviews or sales as indicators of your achievement. You've got to keep writing and only compete with yourself. I think that's really important. I want to try to take my own advice, but I know it's hard. It's not always easy to... You know, you want to, you want people want to make money right away. They want to have, you know, stellar reviews, but it doesn't always happen. It doesn't mean you're a bad writer. Everybody has their own opinion. Some people like cozy, some people like thrillers, some people like romances. You can't, you know, go by that. But if you're happy with what you're writing, that's the most important thing. And you just got to keep at it and you'll get better. Wow, that that's a lot of good advice. And I, I want to thank you for that because when you talk about beta readers, when you talk about believing in yourself mm -hmm. and and um, really be only being in competition with yourself, that says a lot about the stuff that you put out there. The, the, the fact that when you write, you write for yourself. You write for the stories that you love, for the passion that you mm -hmm. have for, for everything that you're right. doing. That is really what every writer should be following. And, and it's great that, that you have that type of advice because sometimes, you know, just like everybody in the world, we just, sometimes we just need to hear it. You know, um, we know it in the back of our minds, but sometimes mm -hmm. we just need to hear it. So I want to thank you for that. that that's, that's thank you. I mean, <laughs> yes. I, I, the thing is, I do, I write, I have to be happy with my own work, you know, I'm my own judge. 
Um, not everyone's going to like my work. I understand that, you know, and it does, it does, you know, negative reviews do hurt authors. Um, it, you know, but you can't take it personally. You got to realize, you know, not everybody's going to love your work, but if you're happy with it, that's the main thing. And you just keep, you know, you keep being your own judge. You keep, you know, right doing your best and that's all you can do. Oh, well, that's great. Well, now we've hit the part of the show. For one, I, I want to thank you for being mm-hmm. part of this because this is the final show of season two. Right. Now, I've talked to authors. I've talked to literary heroes. But you are the very first librarian that the Emmett Blackwell show has ever had. And because oh. of that, mm-hmm. <laughs> I must confess a few things. Uh-oh. <laughs> We're calling this segment Confessions to a Librarian. Confession number one. When I was 10, I used a half a piece of bologna as a bookmark. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Confession number two. When I was 11, I rearranged the card index for the letter B so that it wasn't in any particular order. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I'm wow. just getting this all out, you know, seeing as how you're a librarian, you're here. Might as well get it out. Okay, here we go. Confession number three. I currently have three books still checked out, but I have no clue where they are. Oh, yeah. it's not you, good. You, you thought it was a really bad one. Don't, don't worry. They get worse. All right. Confession number four. I once hummed as loud as I could just so that people would be distracted, and it was absolutely hilarious. They were looking around and everything. It was horrible. All right. Confession number five. Oh, jeez. You have a lot of confessions. I know. It's really sad, isn't it? When I was younger, I went down one of those book aisles, right? And I pulled Mm -hmm. down all the hardcover books and made a giant domino chain. And then (laughs) I pushed it down just as the librarian came around the corner. It snaked between the bookshelves and totally freaked her out. And she probably thought it was a ghost or something. And now, for my final confession. Oh, boy. I lied. I actually have six books checked out from when I was 10 years old. Also, oh my. Also, one of those books may or may not still have a piece of bologna in it. So, yeah. Ew. So now that I have all that off my chest, thank you so much for being on the show. It's great to have a librarian who's also a writer, who's also part of writing groups, who's, who's written multiple novels. And I just want to thank you so much for being here on the show. Where can people find your books? They can find them on Amazon, just Amazon.com. I have an author page. Um, also, my website, DebbieDLouise.com, links to, you know, well, my, my Amazon page, basically. But, you know, you can see my books there. And I do, I know I have a blog on my website. Uh, I have a lot of authors on there, but my books are there also. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I have an author page. I also am on Twitter, Deb Librarian. And you said you have an event coming up, too. When was that, and what was it? Uh, the Long Island, um, it's the um, Islip Arts Council in Islip, uh, New York, on Long Island. Um, it's an art and book fair that's going to be at Brookwood Hall. Um, it's the art, Arts Council's holding. It's, it's books and art, a holiday books and arts fair. All right. Well, thank you, Debbie. It was an amazing interview. Thank you so much for being here on the show. Thank you for, for, for closing out season two. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure, Emma. Thank you very much. And return those library books. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but not the baloney. Not the baloney. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> it may have disintegrated at this point. Um, but anyhow, everybody who's out there listening, this is Emmett Blackwell. I just want to let you all know that we will be back in January for season three. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being part of this entire project. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. I admired authors. I wanted to, you know, be one one day. So that was a dream of mine since I was very young. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. 